Excellent. Thank you, Liz, and welcome everyone to webinar five on building capacity. Uh, here's the page on Connect, so feel free to uh, to use it to you know follow up, to ask questions, to uh, check uh, the the self description from some of the speakers, um, and uh, feel free to use the chat for the questions. Uh, probably some of the speakers will be able to uh, to respond directly, but uh, we'll. Uh, do the uh, the, session, the the presentations one at a time, and then do the questions mostly at the end uh, for the last half hour. Uh, as you can tell, uh, low, um, live closed captioning is enabled, so feel free to use it if you need it. Uh, and the recording will be available uh, after the fact, after a little while, on the same page uh, from the session. So I'd like to welcome you from uh, Chochake, uh, also called Montreal, on the traditional unceded territory of the Kanangahaga people. And uh, welcome to this uh, this panel on building, building capacity, this, this webinar session on build, building capacity. Um, I will let uh, people introduce themselves instead of butchering their names. Uh, so uh, Brenna, why don't, don't you start? Try unmute first, that would be a good idea. Hi, thanks so much. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so hopefully folks are seeing my uh, my PowerPoint slides with no problem here. Um, and I am going to just uh, share in the chat, although I did just lose the chat, where did you go? There it is. Um, there's a resource available. Uh, it's in the chat there. Um, with all of the H5P activities I'm going to talk about today. Um, and if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of that page, there's a resources link and you can actually just download a zip file of all the H5P objects at once, um, rather than going through that painstaking process of <laughs> downloading them all separately. So uh, the slides are also there. Please do feel free to share anything here that's useful. Um, my name is Brenna Clark Gray. I'm coordinator of educational technologies at Thompson Rivers University, and uh, I'm here to talk about using H5P to support composition practice. And I see this as a capacity building concern um, because I think that H5P has a lot of promise for open ended formative um, feedback in composition studies. And uh, I just I haven't seen the take up there that I would love to see. So that's mostly what I'm talking about today. Uh, I am an uninvited visitor on Tecumseh-Swetmik territory within the unceded traditional lands of Swetmagulu, where learning has taken place since time immemorial. And I am grateful to and shaped by time spent in Algonquin Anishinaabeg, Wulistuk and Mi'kmaq, and Kikite lands. So uh, the genesis of the project that I'm talking about today, or really, I guess, my interest in using H5P in this particular way, uh, it comes from first, so I transitioned into faculty support from being a full-time community college teacher, primarily of academic writing. Um, so I had done that job for nine years, and then I transitioned into uh, this role as coordinator of educational technologies with an interest particularly in supporting faculty, um, well, with all kinds of practice, but my expertise is definitely in supporting composition practice. And um, right around the time that I transitioned into this role, which was August of 2019, I signed up for a Lumen Learning Hackathon. I had heard about H5P kind of vaguely, thought it was sort of cool. Um, and this was one of their um, continuous improvement workshops where they ask you to go and uh, sort of solve for a problem, a, a sticky point in one of the OERs. And so the one that I jumped in to try to help resolve um, was around creating a working thesis statement. This was a really um, great introduction to H5P. And if you ever have an opportunity to take part in one of these uh, hackathons, they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, and in this case, the assignment was specifically to use the course presentation type. So I spent some time playing around with the course presentation type, but it led to me starting to want to explore new ways for building composition feedback in H5P. Um, I, I, I have noted here, and I think it's important, I got a lot of time to play. Um, I have a, uh, a director who's very um, encouraging of spending time playing with and building resources. And um, I was also building faculty competencies along the way, but I got a chance to just spend a lot of time in my office messing around with H5P and also leading workshops on it. 
which gave me the space to think through um, when a BC campus grant came up. This was the, um, uh, the grant for improving existing OER in press books or augmenting them with H5P exercises. And so our unit put together um, an application to improve an existing OER, Writing for Success First Canadian Edition. Um, and I was able to hire two students to develop the learning objects for that book. And I think we ended up creating about 200 H5P objects for that textbook over um, the course of a much longer period than I originally contracted to work on it for. Uh, it sort of spiraled, but it's finished now, so it's fine. Um, and that project was uh, a really good introduction for me to the range of types that we could use. And the value of bringing in additional voices and, and thought in terms of how to use the resources. And for us, the key component really was the student involvement. So our RAs on this project were um, Lintz Tomi and Ashmita Roy. Um, they were two student RAs and they took responsibility for actually just reading the textbook. They had both completed first year composition courses successfully. And so the first task we assigned them was read the textbook and identify the sticking points. Where would um, some additional support, feedback or practice help you as a student moving through this material? Um, and they also identified an entire activity type and application that I had not considered for a composition textbook. So um, they suggested, particularly I should say Lintz who, who suggested and then developed these resources um, using flashcards for key terms at the end of each chapter, which had not been on the project radar at all. I, I wasn't really thinking of key terms in relation to the text. And there weren't a lot, there wasn't like, it's not like there was a glossary at the end of each chapter as you might see in a first year science textbook, for example. Um, but the students recommended this as, as something to help move students and particularly second language speakers through the material. So really critical to the, the breadth of what we were able to achieve with this textbook was the student involvement. But for me, the gateway activity was the thesis development exercise. And you will find that posted to the, the resource that I, I posted about earlier at uh, oeglobal21.truebox.ca. Um, I have done thesis development exercises with my students always. Uh, and typically we devote a lot of class time to this. Um, and it's a way to walk students through the process of going from a question or a prompt to a working thesis statement. Lots of free writing, lots of um, determining what you already know about the topic, lots of examining where you wanna go, lots of examining what kinds of questions you have. Um, and one of the things that I have often struggled with with students is sort of signaling the value and importance of this work of giving time over to this kind of free writing you know, and my practice in the classroom changed over the years. I used to ask students to just pull out a blank sheet of paper to do their free writing. Uh, and over time, I realized that just the act of me bringing in a handout for the free writing made the whole thing seem more formal, official, and sort of worthy of time. So exploring H5P in this regard kind of did the same thing. And I'll talk a little bit about the importance of devoting space to um, this kind of drafting and practice work in a composition class in a second. Uh, this was the first resource I developed in, with this idea in mind of trying to capture my classroom thesis development exercise as something that could be sort of portable and reusable. Um, and it's been fun to see various instructors in communications and English and actually other subjects that matter experts at sorry, other subject areas at TRU as well, pick up this particular exercise and adapt it for their own classroom practice. So this was my first activity and my kind of proof of concept <laughs> for the idea of using H5P in composition classes. We know probably most people who are here, H5P, if you're if you haven't been exposed to it, it's a really neat little, they're very easy to create learning objects that you can um, stick in anywhere. Most learning management systems will work with it. WordPress loves H5P, Pressbooks, you can stick them in anywhere. Um, and they're great little interactives. Um, it's really established in reviewing closed-ended concepts, right? Lots of multiple choice questions, lots of true and false, lots of sort of fill in the blanks, those kinds of questions, really easy and straightforward to adapt into H5P. Um, but 
as I've suggested here, I'm interested in how we adapt stickier and messier skills development in somewhat subjective fields like composition, right? Like I can't just put, well, here's the right answer to the summary in an H5P exercise without um, potentially really truncating and like throwing off <laughs> student experience um, and, and, and shutting down their own creativity, which isn't part of the goal, right? So students also need to do rough work and they need to draft and master composition skills. So how do we signal the value and importance of drafting and review? Anybody who has taught a composition course knows that drafting and review is often where we lose students, right? Because they have so many competing um, needs and concerns and pressures on their time that sometimes review and rewrite and draft are like the last things they want to engage in. So as I say, it's rare I can offer students a right answer, right? Not a lot of fill in the blank possibility, but tools that allow me to build sample responses and simultaneously cue aspects of the sample response are really quite critical. And that's where a tool like Essay in H5P has become really central to a lot of what I do in my practice. Because marking formal essays is really, really time consuming, I find that as instructors of composition, we often spend the lion's share of our feedback time on final comments on essays, which is unfortunately the point in the process when students can't act on that feedback anymore, right? It's sort of like, well, what am I gonna do with this? Thanks, lady. Um, so what I'm imagining here is judicious use of H5P to both create and guide formative exercises so that they are both reinforcing key concepts and offering a kind of early intervention feedback to students at the rough work stage. Um, and automating a bit of this through H5P allows more feedback to reach more students in a more timely fashion um, than sometimes is possible with the way we tend to mark traditional essays. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. And I'm talking primarily today about the summary tool, the essay tool, and the documentation tool. Um, and these sort of range from um, most suitable to more closed end practice to sort of very, very open ended from the summary to the documentation tool. You will see examples of all of these on the site that I linked earlier, and I'll post the link in the chat one more time just in case. Um, and the reason why I'm not doing a live work walkthrough of these activities is because uh, I almost always, when I do a live walkthrough of activities, a, get lost in the weeds, and uh, B, run over time. So instead, I'm going to try to stick to the key components here in this PowerPoint and then um, it, encourage you to go and explore the resources that I have posted. Um, and by all means, follow up with me if you want to talk more. So uh, the summary tool is one that I really like um, because it's, it's actually kind of like a chronology tool, right? So the summary tool in H5P asks you to pick the best answer from a series of answers and it, it can generate a paragraph from that. Um, what I like to use it for is when I'm teaching students things like how to order ideas in a paragraph. So you'll see this version asks students to put the statements, which are about how I make a latte in the morning, into correct chronological order. What's nice is that Things like the tooltip function in H5P, which is what we have up here. If you're looking at this live on the website, you'll see that you can uh, hover over this I, and what it does is it, it gives students the definition of chronological order again and how that works in paragraph structure. So similarly, you'll see an example of this using ordered importance as the structuring philosophy, and the same idea. You cover over the tooltip, you get your order of importance um, to pop up. When students put all of these in order, they get this progress bar uh, here, which lets them know, oops, sorry, which lets them know if they're getting them in the right order or not. And they can repeat each step along the way. So the idea here is, can you successfully identify an introductory statement? Can you successfully identify a concluding statement? Can you um, identify where the items come in order? And then the tooltips within H5P allow you to give feedback about each of those component parts along the way. The essay tool, somewhat paradoxically or confusingly, the essay tool is my favorite thing to use to teach summary right now. So I don't use the summary tool for summary, I use the essay tool for summary. Um, but when I'm teaching summary or precy writing, the nice thing about 
um, the essay tool. And this is gonna be small on your screen, but do please go and explore it after the fact. Um, you can give the students a passage, right? And I've expanded this out to two levels. So when students first see this, they just get those first two, they get the text and they get the box. Um, what we have after here is a sample solution. So I can provide a sample solution to students. One thing I make sure to note is that this is not the only way to paraphrase. And then what I asked H5P to do is to give students feedback about whether or not they've achieved key concepts. So within a summary, I wanna make sure I hit all the main points and I wanna make sure I cite my source, right? And so what I've done here is pulled out key terms from the original text to determine that students have achieved these key points or they've achieved making note of these key points. In the back end of the H5P exercise, as you'll see if you download them, you can specify synonyms for all of these and I have tried to do so, right? So there's a list of sort of synonyms so that they, they at least hit the concept, right? And again, one of the things that I note um, in the feedback that students get with the score is try not to worry too much about the score as a number and instead take a look at whether or not you've hit all of these key concepts. And also, you know, including the source, right? So I include the source's last name as a reminder that you have to have the source at the end of your pricey or your summary. This also works really well for teaching paraphrase. Um, obviously, it would be a much shorter exercise in that case. And then um, using the documentation tool, one of the things I like, so the documentation tool, we could talk about a lot. <laughs> and uh, I do encourage you to check out like the thesis development exercise and how it works. And actually, I just saw Alessandra's question about um, automated feedback and peer assessment. So I don't think automated feedback is a replacement for peer assessment, but I do like the way in which you could use the documentation tool to signal the value of peer assessment. So just like this, using H5P, these tools embedded in the textbook, for example, themselves can really signal the importance of using um, the tool with your students. Um, at the same time, I think giving this space over to peer review also signals the value and importance of that work. But the thing that I, if I'm only focusing on one aspect of documentation tool that I like, I really like the criteria functionality within um, within the documentation tool, what it what I like to do with it is remind students of the key. So, you know, your summary should be 100 words. It should include all the key points in the original article. It should demonstrate good use of your own vocabulary um, and use objective language. And then I have students explain in their own words how they're going to meet all four of those criteria. So they're invited to give a sentence explaining how they will meet those criteria. And then, um, down here, when they get to the reviewing criteria stage, they're reminded of what they said they would do. And they can go back and read what they created and see if they actually met the criteria that they said they were going to. So it offers a little bit of space um, for a guided self-reflection on the assignment and to see if they are meeting their own goals as they're working through the sort of criteria of the assessment. And you'll see two different examples of this on the resource that I provided the link to. And then a bonus, this kind of came to me late, but I really like it. I do a lot of checklists with students when they're getting ready to get towards submission. So, you know, I, you know, my old version is like a big yellow handout that they get, they had to tick off that they'd done all these things before they handed in their essay and they'd have time to review or ask questions about them. Um, in this case, what I've done is repurpose the multiple choice activity within H5P. If you make all the answers correct, <laughs> um, you can go through and, and require students to go and say, okay, I have an engaging introduction. I have a reasonable specific thesis. I have uh, acknowledgement of the argument limits. And you could even include tool tips for each one of these questions that would give them a chance to review back in their textbooks, right, where they might find these pieces. Um, and when they go through and they hit check, if they have any of these not checked off yet, it sort of bumps them back. It says, okay, well, don't worry, the essay is not due until next week, but you need to go back and make sure you have a range of evidence from credible sources before you submit your assignment. And I can see I am almost out of time. So uh, I do wanna encourage you to download any of the samples as a place to start if you wanna explore these ideas yourself. And I don't wanna leave without making a note about accessibility. Um, so all the tools that I've highlighted today do work with screen readers, uh, but one thing that I've learned 
developing these more lengthy activities for um, students is to actually download a screen reading tool yourself and test it out. So read and write is um, freely available and one that is sort of easy to use. Um, it's just worth testing out what the experience is like, particularly for, I find lengthy use of the documentation tool, making sure all of the, um, all the pieces are kind of falling where you mean them to and that the logic makes sense. Um, and then my other big bugbear around accessibility is that we do at TRU on the open learning side have lots of students who engage with OERs offline for all kinds of reasons. Um, we serve incarcerated people, um, we serve people in remote locations, all kinds of reasons why you may not have access to the online textbook. And so one thing that I've been um, chatting with the good folks at Pressbooks about is thinking about how we can replicate these H5P exercises within the Pressbook as what we call page one printables. So the idea would be that, um, for example, a fill in the blank activity, you don't need to have the H5P exercise to have that page one activity that works, right? You can fill in the blank with a pen on your own. And if we can get to that place with Pressbooks and a big shout out to Steel Wagstaff, who I know has this top of mind in his development, um, that will change the way something like a documentation tool is developed. So right now you'll see my documentation tools tend to be like multi-page affairs. If we get to a page one printable stage with H5P, that's a place where I would be doing some redevelopment. Um, Okay, that feels like I talked really fast and I think I still went long. So I apologize. Thank you for your time today. I'm really excited to discuss this more and I hope you'll uh, spend some time playing around with the resource that I sent. You can also always feel free to email me or find me on Twitter uh, and we can talk more. Thank you so much. You actually didn't go long. <laughs> <laughs> I put myself uh, uh, an alarm and uh, it, it rang just as you were finishing. Um, so, you know, and we actually started a little bit early because uh, we didn't go around in, uh, to introduce uh, everyone uh, all at the same time. So we're already uh, f uh, talking with Melissa. Uh, Welcome everyone. I'm just going to share my screen here. So hopefully you're seeing my slides. Okay, awesome. So my name is Melissa Ashman. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm coming to you today from the unceded tradition on ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Tawasan, Kikai, and Coquitlam peoples. In Canada, this Thursday, September 30th, will mark the first national day for truth and reconciliation. And I invite all of you, regardless of where you are located, to learn more about the peoples and the histories of the lands on which you study, work, and play. The research project I will be telling you about today was completed during my time as Open Education Research Fellow at Kwantlen Polytechnic University from 2020 to 2021. So in my presentation, I will describe the background and context for this project, explain my methods and sampling, share some of my results, and discuss the implications and some of the limitations of my research. Like many, I have found engaging in open, uh, open pedagogy to be transformative. Students shift from being consumers of knowledge to being creators of knowledge. And this seems to visibly change their experience in the course. And the roles of instructors change from being a source of knowledge to being a guide to help students have impacts outside of themselves or beyond their assignments and learning activities. So I was really curious to explore this more. There is a lot of research available on the costs, outcomes, uses, and perceptions of OERs, but there isn't as much research on open pedagogy. Uh, most studies have been done outside of Canada. Studies have, that have been done have been explored faculty perceptions or student perceptions, sometimes both, but often with smaller samples and often only exploring or reporting on one or two open pedagogy practices at a time. To date, there have been no studies that I'm aware of that have explored perceptions of open pedagogy, broadly speaking, so not limited to a particular type, by faculty and students across multiple classes that are using different types of open pedagogy. 
The research that is available in this area does show that students and faculty tend to view open pedagogy positively overall, but the provision of additional supports could be helpful to students and faculty alike. Ultimately, how can faculty support students who are engaging in open pedagogy? How can faculty set themselves up for success? And how can institutions support faculty and students? Overall, this project supports the criteria for the UNESCO OER recommendation of building capacity um, in a couple of ways. First, the results provide an opportunity to build awareness about how open pedagogy and open education practices can motivate and empower educators and students to create knowledge together. And second, the results of this study suggest gaps and areas where institutional support could be helpful to faculty who wish to engage in open pedagogy. So I had two research questions. What are the perceptions of faculty towards open pedagogy and what are the perceptions of students towards open pedagogy? My study was two pronged and I wanted it that way because I wanted to be able to compare and contrast the experiences and perceptions of faculty and students. Um, could there potentially be a disconnect? Anecdotally, I have heard from students that open pedagogy is great. And I know many faculty have felt that way as well. But what if these voices speaking positively about open pedagogy were simply louder than the beliefs or the thoughts of the group as on the whole? So there are many open pedagogy practitioners at KPU, which makes this a great setting to explore this topic. We have a ton of admin supports for open education, including an office of open education, library support, uh, grant funding and other supports for OER adaption, adoption and creation. We regularly have workshops on open education and open pedagogy. We have a community of practice and teaching fellows. Open education is even embedded in the strategic plan for our institution, which makes KPU a really great place to investigate this topic. So I compiled a list of 67 faculty members who had expressed interest in open ed or open pedagogy, who were known to be engaged in these practices, who'd expressed interest, who'd gone to PD events, or who were known by colleagues to be interested. And I reached out to these faculty members to get their consent to participate. And participation meant they would be teaching one or more courses yeah, at KPU in the spring 2021 and or summer semesters, where they would be using one or more open pedagogy practices, and they consented to receive a faculty survey in the spring semester, and they would distribute a student, uh, sorry, a survey to my students on my behalf. So in total, 11 out of the 67 faculty members agreed to participate. My student participants were those who received the survey from their instructor in the class or classes where they were engaging in open pedagogy in the spring or summer. I cannot say for sure how many students ended up receiving the invitation to the survey because some faculty did not get back to me about um, how many students were receiving the messages for whatever reason. So I don't actually know if all 11 faculty who agreed to participate ended up sending the survey. I did an incomplete tally, putting the total potentially at more than 700 students who received the survey, but I don't know who many, how many actually did. I don't have specific demographic information about the students who responded to my survey, but at KPU overall, 27% of students are international students, 64% of domestic students, and 96% of international students are multilingual. 32% of domestic students and 48% of international students are first generation. 53% of domestic students and 64% of international students work 10 or more hours per week. And 68% of domestic students and 95% of international students are full-time students. So in this study, I used a definition of open pedagogy that moved beyond simply leveraging the five R's um, to explain to the explanation provided by Jangiani and DeRosa, whereby open pedagogy allows students to have impacts uh, beyond themselves and potentially beyond their classroom walls, whether or not they're specifically openly licensing their work. So in the surveys I provided to the faculty and students, I provided some examples of open pedagogy, which I sourced from faculty early in the survey development stage, and those examples are on screen. In addition, in the survey to students, 
um, I was exploring how they perceived open pedagogy in comparison to traditional learning activities, which I defined as essays, quizzes, and exams. So the surveys for both faculty and student asked open and closed questions, and I analyzed the qualitative data to see what themes emerged. I also analyzed the qualitative data quantitatively. Um, some questions in the surveys came from uh, were reused and or adapted from other past surveys um, and those links those sources are on screen here. I don't have time to share all of my results, so I will just be highlighting some of them. There were eight faculty who ended up providing responses to my faculty survey, um, which is a little lower than I'd hoped for but what can you do? Um, the years of experience, uh, the average was about 13.4 years. The faculty had between one to 10 years of experience teaching using open pedagogy. Seven out of the eight used multiple open pedagogy practices and all of them used OERs. And three quarters of the faculty said they need more time to prep for using open pedagogy than traditional activities. There were eight themes that emerged in the comments about what prompted instructors to start using open pedagogy. Um, the comments from the, some of the respondents covered more than one theme. So the top ones were beliefs about open pedagogy, improving the experience for students, um, costs, as well as issues relating to access, equity, inclusion, and social justice. It was interesting to see what continues to motivate instructors to keep using open pedagogy. Um, there were eight themes that emerged and some of the top themes were providing an improved experience for students, students having the ability to share their work beyond the instructor. Um, again, issues relating to equity, access and social justice, as well as alignment of open pedagogy with an instructor's teaching practices or philosophies or interests. In terms of what benefits faculty have experienced, there were nine themes that emerged and the top two were the improved quality of student work and assignments and student engagement in the courses, as well as how open pedagogy positively changed the dynamic or the relationship between students and their instructor. While open pedagogy was viewed uh, overwhelmingly positive by faculty. They did, of course, experience challenges. There were seven themes that emerged and the top five related to time. So not enough time to prepare, to plan, to complete projects, to get student buy-in. Challenges related to finding opportunities, a lack of funding, compensation, or recognition for the work. Um, overcoming student anxiety to the process and project, um, as well as a lack of support from colleagues. The results on the student side were really interesting to me and there were 55 respondents in total. To be honest, I was really expecting. Oh, good thing to see more of a, a distribution in the response. Again, the responses were overwhelmingly positive. So the next few slides will have some complicated looking boxes like this. You'll just simply uh, read them from left to right to build your sentence, build your result. So overwhelmingly students found open pedagogy to be more valuable, more engaging and more creative in comparison to traditional learning activities. And much of this is consistent with faculty respondents, um, their responses about the perceived benefits of open pedagogy, as well as feedback that faculty said they've received from students. Overall, students seem to have had a more motivating and more rewarding and enjoyable experience completing open pedagogy compared to traditional learning activities. And while some students did find open pedagogy to be more difficult, um, just over 40% strongly or disagreed that it was more difficult. And while some students did find open pedagogy to be more stressful, um, half disagreed with that statement and just over 30% neither agreed nor disagreed. And the much of this is consistent with the faculty responses. The results were varied on whether open pedagogy was perceived to be more time consuming than traditional learning activities. 43.6% of respondents um, agreed with that statement, whereas just under 30% disagreed. And these results are somewhat ish, uh, consistent with results later in the survey, where just over 60% of respondents felt the time to complete open pedagogy was longer, um, whereas 30% said it was about the same. 
Overall, students seem to think their learning was better with open pedagogy in comparison to traditional learning activities. And students provided many responses and comments about what they liked about engaging in open pedagogy and the top few themes related to um, the improvement in the use of creativity, the flexibility and the choice that it was just simply more interesting or more fun, and because they had the opportunity to collaborate with others. And again, a lot of this is consistent with the faculty uh, comments. Students also provided comments about what they found to be challenging um, and the top few themes related to time. Uh, time is definitely a theme here. Feeling uncomfortable with the process and the choices, working with others, uh, the cognitive demands was greater for some, as well as technology issues. It's interesting to me to note that despite three students indicating they found collaborating with others to be challenging, by and large, most people seem to have a positive experience in working with others. And the something else I found interesting to note were the larger number of students who reported having issues with time, but surprisingly few faculty shared this as feedback about open pedagogy that they've received from students. There were some faculty who mentioned this, but not as many as the student comments might indicate. And I was also surprised that there weren't really any significant comments or concerns about privacy. So there are a number of limitations with my study. Um, smaller sample sizes for sure, and the data was self-reported. One of the positive features of my study was that it lumped together classes using different open pedagogy practices, but there was potentially uneven participation between the classes. So I don't know um, if everyone from every class participated. Because I was reliant on faculty uh, to distribute the survey on my behalf, I didn't have full control over the timing of the distribution. Um, different instructors may use various open pedagogy practices at different points in the semester. And so it's hard to tell whether some of the students might have received the survey in the middle of the messiness of their project or at the end of the semester. And this study was done during COVID times. We are still in a pandemic. So it's hard to discern whether some of the challenges the students experienced were the result of completing their coursework online or at a distance, the project parameters, if there were issues relating to technology and internet access and equity. Um, so it would be interesting to repeat this study once there are face-to-face -face classes again to see if and how these ch uh, challenges might change. The study was also done at one institution and a very unique one in BC, so I don't know how transferable the results might be to other institutions in Canada. I'm going through my data still and revisiting it and interpreting it more, but overall the results from the stud study are really consistent with what previous studies have found. Um, but based on my results, there are a few actionable items that are starting to emerge. It's clear that students feel that open pedagogy approaches are helping them to learn and apply the material and have an impact. And uh, the results provided by faculty and students were more or less consistent with each other, which was nice to see. It seems everyone is short on time, aren't we all? But especially when it comes to open pedagogy, it was a really significant takeaway from this study that students could potentially benefit from having more time in class and in the semester to complete open pedagogy projects. As well, faculty um, who want to use open pedagogy in their classes could consider building in even more time for the projects and practices to take place. As well, faculty could potentially benefit from having schedule or time release um, to support in prepping and planning open pedagogy approaches, as well as having institutional supports to find opportunities to make an impact outside the class. Students could potentially benefit from having more upfront discussions with their instructors about the process and navigating other uncertainties posed by the open pedagogy approach that aren't typically encountered with traditional learning activities. Faculty should be aware of how they can support building student confidence in decision making relating to content accuracy. So for example, what additional checkpoints might be helpful. Fourth, faculty could consider providing students with more opportunity for flexibility and choice, as well as opportunities to collaborate with others. So for example, instead of having students blog all alone, could they peer review each other's blogs? 
And fifth, institutions could provide more professional development opportunities for faculty in areas relating to open education, open pedagogy, and learner-centered instruction. And this could include workshops and opportunities to network and collaborate with others engaged in similar practices at the institution. And lastly, institutions could provide recognition for faculty who engage in open pedagogy, including providing admin support, resources and funding or compensation. Open pedagogy uh, practices have impacts on students, on faculty, on the class as a whole, and potentially on communities outside the walls of the classroom. And the impact of open pedagogy work, plus the fact that 89.1% of student respondents said they would enroll in a course if they knew the instructor was using open pedagogy, it's clear that open pedagogy could have significant impacts on course, program, and institutional enrollments. And this work needs to be supported in ways that are proportional to the investment that faculty and students make to engage in open pedagogy. So my project would not have been possible without the support of so many individuals, Dr. Rajiv Jangiani, Aruj Nizami, who you get to hear from next, um, and others in KPU Open Education. Um, so thank you to everyone. Thank you for your interest in my project. Excellent, and excellent timing as well. Uh, so I noticed that uh, Kate asked one question in the chat. I encourage you to uh, do so, uh, all of the others. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we'll take the questions at the end, but uh, I'm sure Melissa can answer in the chat and others can share as well uh, whether or not uh, it fits uh, in different uh, class levels. Um, you can also uh, post on the page for this webinar on connect uh, i would encourage you uh, to do so so now we can move on to uh, michael shinta deborah debbie and uh, rouge uh, who can introduce themselves and uh, tell us about this thank project. you and, and welcome uh, we're happy to be here and what a great segue uh, from the list study on open pedagogy and and the impact it has on on students and their assignments and this presentation is a faculty fellowship, an international faculty fellowship that focuses on open pedagogy and the UN SDGs. I'm Mike Mills from Montgomery College, uh, right outside the Washington DC in Maryland, and I'll have the rest of the leadership team introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Shinta Hernandez and I'm Department Chair of Sociology, Anthropology and Criminal Justice at Montgomery College. Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie Baker. I'm an instructional designer with the Maricopa Center for Learning and Innovation. And I am also currently uh, one of our interim co-coordinators for OER across the district while our faculty coordinator uh, went to space last week <laughs> or two weeks ago. So she was one of the um, members of the crew for the Inspiration4 mission. So I'm um, really excited to be here and uh, talk to you about this fellowship. Hi, I'm Aruj. I'm a trained librarian and the open education strategist at Kwatlen Polytechnic University in um, Surrey, British Columbia. Well, before we get started with the presentation, it's important for us that we uh, do land acknowledgements. So I'd like to first begin by acknowledging the Piscataway people, traditional custodians of the land on which we at Montgomery College reside here in Maryland. We also want to acknowledge the 22 Native nations that have inhabited the land on which we reside in Arizona. And at KPU, we work, study, and live on the ancestral traditional lands of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Kwantlen First Nation, who have bestowed their name onto the university where I work. So just a, um, a brief history of the, the fellowship. It, it all started at, at an open ed conference. Shinta and I were at a presentation in Anaheim that Cable Green was uh, giving, talking about the SDGs. And we left there thinking, how could we take the, the sustainable development goals and marry them with open pedagogy? So uh, four years ago, we, we started this fellowship at Montgomery College. Uh, looking at a, a collaborative cross-disciplinary interdisciplinary approach to to this work and as we 
got into it, uh, we looked at developing these renewable assignments, having faculty become agents of change with, or helping having students become agents of change within their, their own community. And as Melissa said in, in her research, uh, this isn't easy for students to embrace. It's, it's, it's difficult. And likewise, it wasn't easy for faculty to embrace because they were working, as I said, across disciplines. Uh, as we expanded to include other institutions, it became not only interdisciplinary, but interinstitutional, cross-institutional. So we had Montgomery College faculty, for example, working in a team with Maricopa and KPU faculty. Uh, it, it's just some incredibly rich assignments developed as a result of that. Um, at the end of the, the fellowship, uh, in the spring semester, there's a student showcase and, and we allow students to demonstrate their projects. So the, the faculty deploy their assignments in the fall semester and then the students get an opportunity to showcase those assignments in the spring semester. And it's uh, just an incredible growth opportunity for the students. We've had several students who have told us that these are assignments that they will never forget. Uh, and at this point, Shinta is going to talk a little bit about the conceptual, conceptual framework for the fellowship. Great, thank you. So we created this diagram to help um, illustrate the conceptual framework of OPEN, particularly for any who might need some clarity. So what you see here is at the left of the diagram is OPEN Education. And this is essentially the teaching and learning framework that is centered on accessibility, affordability, equity, inclusion, innovation, and opportunity. And then in the middle of the diagram, we have open pedagogy, which includes the teaching and learning strategies by which educators meet those parameters that I just listed under open education. And then we carry out open or open pedagogy rather through things like curriculum redesign, um, through student engagement practices, assessment, technology. And then now open educational resources on the far right of the diagram, these are the actual efforts that are delivered at the ground level and on the front line. And OERs are the specific applications by which our educators can deliver their open pedagogy. So you see the, the way that all three concepts are linked. Um, some examples of OERs are what we list there. They're renewable assignments, open textbooks, streaming videos, learning modules, open access journals. And for the, in, for the purpose of this fellowship, we're gonna talk specifically about renewable assignments. And so I'm gonna now turn this to Arouge who will speak specifically about renewable assignments. Thanks. So Shinta just outlined the framework for the fellowship by highlighting the opportunities that open educational practices offer the sustainable development goals. But I wanna take a moment to flesh out the renewable assignment piece of this fellowship, since it's one of those threshold concepts that's both challenging for faculty to fully grasp, but also so re rewarding once they do. Um, and you know, just to reiterate, as Melissa's presentation showed us, it's just one of the tools, the renewable assignments in this toolbox of open educational practices. So moving on to this definition, um, a renewable assignment is a form of assessment that centers students as creators of information rather than simply consumers. It's a form of experiential learning or authentic assessment where students demonstrate understanding through the act of creation. The artifacts of open pedagogy are student created and openly licensed so that they may live outside of the classroom in a way that has an impact on the greater community. And so even with that definition, we, you know, we speak to faculty who are new to open pedagogy and who are interested in replacing a disposable assignment with perhaps a renewable one. And we struggle to explain what makes an assignment truly renewable. But this chart is very helpful. So Wiley and Hilton included in one of their articles um, and it explains four components of a renewable assignment. So first, of course, students are creating an artifact but that artifact should also be making a contribution beyond the classroom, beyond a grade, so that it you know, somehow um, maybe makes a contribution in the community where the students find themselves. It should also be shared. And finally, it should also be openly licensed. And in many ways, 
that open license is what enables a assignment to be truly renewable and that somebody else can take it up, adapt it, um, recycle it, if you will. And so, you know, this chart gets us thinking about how there might be various approaches that help mitigate um, the effects of a disposable assignment, but perhaps not all of them are truly renewable and that there are certain things that make an assignment renewable. And this is really what we hope to, um, you know, impart and share with the fellows that you know, come on board because they have parts of this already. They're already practicing all of this stuff, but to be able to articulate it as a as a renewable assignment is is a really um, rewarding part of of this fellowship. I now want to move to highlight one of these standout renewable assignments. So, a collab a collaborative group made up of instructors in urban ecosystems, sustainable horticulture, and anthropology designed three assignments to take a stab at goal two, which is zero hunger. So the goal of these assignments was to have students identify plant life on their campuses and take photos. They openly licensed these photos and uploaded them to an app that was available to the public. And then students populated important information to that app, such as you know whether a plant was edible or not. And the anthropology students um, added histories of the plants and how they were used by certain communities in certain spaces and areas throughout time. And one of the key takeaways here was that so much of the plant life that we've identified as weeds are actually edible and have long histories of sustaining communities. So this is an exemplary assignment because it really is attuned to the framework that Shinta opened with, right? Um, you know, it's a renewable assignment. It takes the it takes this interdisciplinary approach in working with students and it makes an artifact public and usable by folks outside of the classroom. So one of the things that we did this year um, is this fellowship has been um, going for the last um, three years, um, we have built quite a collection of renewable assignments. And so one of the things that we did this year um, is to pull all of those renewable assignments into a press book. And we've organized this press book around the UN SDGs because that is a big focus of the assignments themselves. Um, and uh, provided it in such a way that um, future fellows or people outside the fellowship would be able to reuse um, or build on the existing assignments. So here's a couple of um, things that faculty fellows have said over the years. Um, the, towards the end of each fellowship, we do ask the faculty fellows to reflect on their experience. And so here are some of the kind of highlights of the things that they've said over the last few years. Um, and it really it was really awesome to hear Melissa's presentation because I think what she found it was very much echoed by the things that we've heard from our faculty, um, that it was the highlight of their experience, that it allowed them, allowed them to think outside the box, but also allowed their students to think outside the box. Um, it really opened up the students to focus on something they really wanted to focus on um, and made the work both for the faculty and the students meaningful and beautiful. Um, so an, a comment that was echoed, uh, I think, throughout many of the reflections is really around this idea that they got to see sides of the students that the students had never previously shown in their classes. And so it really built connection. Um, and uh, I, I would even go so far as to say a sense of belonging with students and faculty around these particular experiences. No. So I'm I'm really proud um, at how we've grown, how much we've grown in just these four years. Uh, I, I really want to do a little a bit of a shout out to the leadership team. Uh, so for this year's leadership um, and fellowship, uh, these are the the colleagues that I've had the fortunate opportunity to work so closely with. So we have from Montgomery College here in Maryland, myself, Dr. Mike Mills, and Christine Crefton. 
from Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Canada, Dr. Rajiv Jingani and Uruj Nazami, from Maricopa Community College, Debbie Baker and Dr. Carla Ganim in Arizona, the Community College of Baltimore County in Maryland, uh, Cynthia Roberts Whitelock and Jamie Whitman. Um, and by the way, these four remaining are brand new partners this year. Uh, to continue that, we have Pima Community College, Dr. Josie Milliken in Arizona, and um, Langara College in Canada, Lindsay Tripp, Dr. Alina Buis, and Caroline Corbell, and then Thompson Rivers University, also in Canada, Ken Monroe, Brenda Smith, and Dr. Michelle Harrison. So we, uh, we come from um, different backgrounds in higher ed, like administrators, department chairs, instructional designers, librarians, support staff, I mean, you name it. Uh, together, we make quite the dynamic international leadership team, if I might say so myself. So I wanna say thank you to, to everyone on this team. Now on the next slide, you can see from this table how much we've grown. One of the most fascinating pieces of the data from this growth chart is the number of fellows from the beginning till now. So that's that first row. So you see that we started off in the summer of 2018 with just 15 fellows. And as Mike pointed out, these fellows get grouped into faculty teams that are interdisciplinary and cross-institutional. Um, now, if you look at summer 2021, we have, wow, 43 fellows grouped into 20 faculty teams. Um, and you can also see the institutional partnership growth that I mentioned earlier in that second row when we went from just Montgomery College in the very beginning year to now seven institutional partners across North America. So of course we are certainly very proud of that. Um, the, another exciting piece of data that you can see here is the increasing number of disciplines, that fourth row, uh, who are represented in the fellowship over time. We went from 12 disciplines in the beginning to now 26 disciplines today. So that's of course very exciting because we can see how we've increased the impact over different disciplines that weren't um, a part of this in the beginning. And then where you see TBD in the last column, that means we're still collecting the data from our current cohorts. So we don't yet know um, the number of different courses in which these renewable assignments are being deployed, how many sections of those courses. And of course, we don't yet know how many students will be selected for that February showcase. Um, and in fact, October is the month when we gather the course data. So we'll be able to tell you in a few weeks what uh, those TBDs will translate to. So uh, more soon on, on the, those pieces of information. And then on the next slide is another exciting piece of, uh, of data here where we have the number of students who have been impacted by our fellowship. So from the very bottom there, where it says fall 2018. So what that means is, you know, is the, the fellowships, the fellows rather, create their renewable assignments in the summer and then they deploy their renewable assignments in the fall. So we had 571 students in the fall of 2018 when we first just started um, to last fall over 600, 1600 rather, I'm sorry, uh, students. And then to, we, we don't know yet the number of students this fall, but you can imagine it's gonna be much larger just because we've got more fellows this year than we've ever had in the past. So, um, so we continue to see some excitement uh, as we continue to grow this fellowship. So more to come and stay tuned for the remaining pieces of information. And now I want to turn this over to Mike to talk about another exciting accomplishment. Thanks, Shinta. Uh, last year, we were humbled to be recognized at, at this conference uh, with the Open Pedagogy Award for Excellence uh, by OE Global. We uh, were just thrilled that we were recognized for the, the hard work, but it, it really is an award that belongs to the faculty and the students who have engaged in, in all of this. Um, so we, we are, are thrilled with this, but uh, it's certainly not something that we're resting on. We continue to grow as Shinta just pointed out um, and have a lot more opportunities ahead and then welcome any institution who may be interested in joining this work to reach out to us and we'll have our contact information uh, at the end of the presentation. So one of the things that we do um, towards the conclusion of the fellowship is to have a faculty and student showcase. And this past year, being you know, COVID times and uh, pandemic and online learning and, and all of that, what we did was um, an online faculty and student showcase. And we used um, 
the screenshot that you see here is from a Padlet, where we brought um, the videos of the faculty and student showcases together into one centralized place. But you can also view those uh, faculty and student showcase conversations through the YouTube playlist. Um, we were last year in February through the Arizona Regional OER Conference, um, able to offer some of these in a live online type environment, but really found that the YouTube um, pre-recorded sessions gave faculty and students an opportunity to better showcase, no pun intended, the amazing work that they had done. So if you get a chance or you're interested, please feel free to check out that YouTube playlist. And um, we'll drop the links in the chat um, in just a second. <laughs> Ooh. The leadership team is also committed to improving the experience for the fellows as we go on every year. Um, and, you know, one of the great things about this fellowship, as was highlighted by my colleagues, is that it's made up of, you know, different experts. So we have administrators and structural designers, we have librarians, we have, you know, department chairs. Um, and each of these experts have something unique to to impart with with the fellows and so you know for example this year instructional designers offered their expertise in the form of consultations with various groups um, we were also able to create this press book where we're able to sort of have a record of all of the renewable assignments that were created as part of this fellowship we've you know created a slack channel for asynchronous supports a google site um, and as we look you know, to, to the future of the fellowship, we've also divided the, the committee, um, the leadership team into various committees to continue to build asynchronous resources um, and other sorts of supports for our fellows. So we wanna thank you for uh, giving us the, the time to talk about our, our fellowship. If you have any questions, our contact information is there. Um, and we, we hope to hear from you. Thank you. Excellent, right on time. I don't know what, how how it's happening today, but everything is uh, flowing nicely. So uh, it's nice that there's some interaction in the chat. Keep it up and uh, feel free to use uh, the page on Connect to do as well, to ask questions or to do follow-up, act links and things like that. Uh, so now we can uh, move on with uh, you know, Michelle, Lauren, and Sarah. Hi, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay, thanks, and Lauren. Michelle will get us started. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, and thank you everyone for having us here today. Um, I have to say it's difficult to, to follow the presentation of such impressive programs and initiatives to, um, coming in at the very end. So um, thank you for having us here today um, and welcome to our presentation on building a culture of openness through the creation of a cross-campus OE team at the University of Alberta in Canada. So to begin, we would like to acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and we respect the histories, languages, and cultures of the First Nation, Métis, and Inuit, and all the First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Um, my name is Michelle Braley, and I'm a librarian on the library publishing and digital production team. I'm also the service manager for our Pressbooks Open Textbook Program. And I'm joined by my colleague, Lauren Stieglitz, um, who is the co-chair of the Open Education team and uh, she's also a science librarian. And our colleague, uh, Shara Shaughnessy, Shaughnessy, who's not here but contributes to this work, um, is also the ch a chair of our OER team. So we all have very different roles, but we found ourselves coming together to support open education in our own unique ways. Um, and our presence will, presentation will cover a bit of the progression for how we got here, um, but we hope to spend the majority of time talking about the operationalization of our team and the future vision for that work and hopefully having a good discussion with you. So we know that open education work is so dependent on institutional context. So for your information, this is our context. 
So we're at a large research institution with about or, or, or over 40,000 students. We have multiple campuses, including a French language campus. And our library portfolio includes the Copyright Office, um, museums and special collections. And until the past year or two, um, the portfolio also included the campus bookstore um, and the university press. So for that reason, we have um, close and kind of unique ties with those two units. And now for some quick background on open education, our open education work. So talking about the history of some of our open education work gets really messy. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone here can, um, can relate to this experience of just how much this work is relationship building that feels quite chaotic. And the state of that work, um, and that was the state of the work that I was doing for a number of years. Um, but through that, uh, we built some strong relationships, particularly with our students union um, and Center for Teaching and Learning. As a result, we had an OER grant program that was focused on the adoption and, and adaptation of existing OER course materials. Um, this grant program was co-funded and administered through the Center for Teaching and Learning, the library and the provost office jointly. Um, however, that program um, no longer exists and our support has pivoted from a library's perspective to the library supporting press books for our institution. Um, and we actually host press books for any institution in Alberta who wants access. So this is currently 11 institutions in total. We also have a team dedicated to finding OER for courses. Um, this team will locate OER on request and we've actually done proactive searching for all 100 and 200 level courses on campus. Um, so it's about probably about 150 courses. Um, so really all of this to say is that we have a lot going on all over the place, <laughs> but we've been trying to bring everything together in a way that we can support all the projects, initiatives, and strategy in a way that just one person can't. So I'm going to pass it off to Lauren to dig into that um, team a little bit. So we uh, officially began our open education team last year, like early, well, I guess beginning of the year around like January. It officially came together. And this team has the mandate to increase OER adoption use and reduce textbooks across campus. So this team is based in the library and it's a library initiative, but we have membership outside of the library as well. So within the library, we have Michelle who represents our digital initiative side of the library. We also have multiple subject librarians from uh, each of the major library units and uh, we also have our copyright librarian uh, who is part of the copyright office and our copyright office is under the library, which works well for us. We also have representation from the Students' Union, Center for Teaching and Learning, and we recently just added a faculty member. So we're really covering um, just about every single uh, stakeholder for OERs on campus, which is great. So why did we form this team? Well, really, we wanted to do two things. The first was to move from a reactionary to proactive service delivery model, and also to really make sure this work is sustainable. So uh, as Michelle mentioned, um, last year we did create a small team of library staff who were trained to look for uh, OERs on request. And which, just a second. I'm just talking too much today. So it got a bit of a dry throat. Um, and this this team was really our first move towards being a bit more proactive with our services and proactively looking for OER. And we also uh, wanted to make things sustainable for our librarians. A lot of our OER work was done by Michelle and by uh, subject librarians in a one-off basis. So it was important that we made sure to spread this work uh, to a team, make sure that we had expertise on a team as opposed to just centered in one person. And uh, and this makes it easier uh, for us as well because we can allow subject librarians to choose how much they want to engage with this work or how much they're able to if they don't really have the knowledge. So, a so we provide training to librarians who are interested. We also will look for OERs uh, if a librarian does not want to do that work or is unable to do that work effectively, uh, our team can look for OERs upon request as well. 
Our goal was also to provide strong communications and advocacy across campus. So we have brought together all of those different people so that we can coordinate and collaborate a bit more on the development of OE activities on campus. So a big part of this work has really been building capacity uh, for open education across campus. And we've done, our work uh, really falls into two categories. So work building capacity in the library and outside of the library. So within the library, I've mentioned our team of library assistants who were trained to search for OER. And that has really uh, increased our ability to search for OER. And in, um, in general, we do provide a lot of training for staff. Uh, every year we have a lot of you know, general staff training sessions and we make sure to always include sessions about OERs, about using press books or uh, about um, different open licensing so that we're providing training internally. And we've also done a lot of training about uh, getting librarians using press books. So a lot of our, our librarians have adopted press books to do online library tutorials. And this in turn uh, means that we have a large number of people in the library who have expertise in press books. So we're not really centering that on one person, um, Michelle, who is our press books lead. And so outside of the library, uh, we now hold press books office hours. So it's a drop in time where anyone who's using press books can come and ask any questions and get help. And because we have so many librarians trained on using press books already, this is great. So it's not just one or two people staffing the, the office hours. There's a number of librarians who can. And then uh, because we're all working together with the different stakeholders on campus, it does allow us to uh, be more effective in our advocacy and supporting open education events. Some of the events we support are Open Education Week, uh, a yearly week of uh, presentations held by the Center for Teaching and Learning and also Be Book Smart Fair, which is run by um, the Students' Union. We also want to share some of our early initiatives. Uh, one of the things we've done is integrate our messaging into collections workflows. So collections does tend to work very uh, separately from us and uh, now, if someone requests a book that is unavailable, uh, there will, is messaging in that email back about how they can contact our unit to look for uh, OER alternatives. The university now has a new uh, zero textbook cost indicator pilot. So in our um, course management system, when you sign up for courses, you can see if a course has zero textbook costs. So this is this this semester is the uh, first semester for this pilot, and faculty members just fill out a form if they want their course to be to have this zero textbook cost indicator. So um, we've been working with the students' union about messaging around that and making sure to share that message with our. Uh, librarians and to our faculty members. And then library communications is a big one, making sure that we have uh, set communications that are consistent. Uh, again, not everyone is an expert on OER, so making sure that when subject librarians email their faculty, they have a message they can share uh, very easily uh, has been a, a, a big thing for us too, this, the communications. So for our future work, because uh, our team is still pretty new, so we still have a lot to do, we're looking at increasing student engagement with OER. Some of the things we're looking at are OER awards for favorite press books or uh, best course using OER. Also uh, looking at different library display options. And then we do plan to further develop our OER library guide. So I did mention before the UVA um, is a majority English campus, but we do have a fairly significant French campus. And so it's really important to make sure that any services we provide uh, are also equally provided to our French campus and making sure that we have a very good section in our guide talking about French searching and the availability of French language OER as well, uh, because those things are not, it's not as a uh, as much out there in French as there is for English. 
And we're also looking at more proactively sharing uh, OER alternatives for first and second year courses in a guide. And as this new zero textbook cost indicator rolls out, we're planning to uh, support that and make sure that anyone interested can find OER for their courses. So that's just a little taste of some of the work we're doing. And now back to Michelle. Great. So now some of the challenges that we've noticed and ways forward that we're looking looking forward to. Um, so the first challenge is consistent messaging on a large campus, particularly with multiple campuses. And as a library unit, we also rely on subject librarians to communicate messaging um, across the large campus. And uh, each department, just that they communicate, they have different relationships with. Um, those departments have different needs and ways of communicating. So it's just hard to get that consistent messaging um, go across such a, a large amount of people. Um, another component, as mentioned already, um, is having the French language campus and the additional challenges with availability of OER in the French language. Um, we've also talked about success, but with our current initiative, we really have no measure of what success is. As you can all likely relate, we've just been responding to needs as best as we can over this pandemic um, with little time to think about what that assessment component looks like. And, and finally, I was excited to about the opportunity to expand the open education work to, to a team. Um, but it's been surprisingly difficult to transition to being part of a team after working independently on that work for so long. And finally, um, because open ed was not organized as part of a formal team before, my response to work was mostly um, reactionary focus as things came up. Um, but having a team means taking more of a proactive approach and including external partners in more meaningful ways. Um, and incorporating that more is something that I'm really looking forward to. So now let's end on a high note of <laughs> thinking where you can start and a few recommendations that we've noticed for capacity building. Um, so first, very practically, considering your library, your institution, um, and your open education program strategic goals to best identify stakeholders. Um, so for us, the main goal was cost savings to students. So we knew that supporting the students union and amplifying their work was key for us. Um, but more practically, just starting where, where you're at on your campus with campus relationships and nurturing those, those relationships over time. The other consideration is practically um, considering the best roles for you and the area that you have control over in open ed on your campus. It took us a number of years to situate our role on our campus um, in a way that responded meaningfully to campus needs. So things like considering subject librarian relationships, existing services around publishing or repositories, and opportunities for utilizing those amazing librarian super search powers um, are places that you can start. And the final suggestion um, we had for getting started is building multiple strategy for open ed support. This could um, include training for public service staff in the library, building expertise around open education publishing, collaborating with faculty champions and supporting and showcasing that work, um, supporting campus partners in their own initiatives. Um, of course, having a unified campus approach but would be great, but on a large campus, just that environmental scanning of what's going on and how we can get involved is a great tool for awareness building. Um, one recent success we've had with this is a student is the student led um, course indicators program. Our role has largely been mentoring um, the students leading this initiative, but also through this we've been able to build a relationship with the registrar's office in a new way that's been really meaningful because the registrar's office manages that course reg registration tool. So the registrar's office now knows that um, when instructors are interested in the zero textbook cost program that they can forward them to us in the library and we'll guide them through that work and we can help them locate free materials for their courses. And finally, we have this as a simple line to engage administration, but we all know how difficult that actually is. Um, for us, working with the students union has been most impactful since the these student representatives are on a lot of committees that directly impact the governance of the institution. So a highlight for me was that a new student rep actually just casually 
CC'd me on an email to introduce me to the university president to brief him on open education work. Um, so I guess really the point here is just that um, keep trying and taking any little steps that you can to get any attention to this work. So that brings us to the end of our slides. Thank you for listening and I hope we can um, have a great discussion in the chat. Excellent, wonderful. I'm, I'm really taken by the fact that we're able to, to finish even before time. So we have quite a bit of time uh, for discussion and including if you raise your hand, if you want to speak up, that's uh, certainly possible. Uh, we're not using the webinar format uh, from Zoom, so we can actually have some people participate uh, orally as well. So are there hands coming up or just issues that you want to discuss? You can uh, put that in the Slack as well, the, the chat as well. Or maybe connecting threads uh, throughout the, the, the four presentations because it was very diverse, but at the same time, there were some threads uh, being connected. the 10 second rule. <laughs> so anyone wants to speak up? I'm not seeing any hand. And Liz is there. Christina if... has her hand. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I didn't see. see. Oh, wow, there you go. I didn't see it. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much to everybody for these fantastic presentations. Um, the, the first question I have, and I may think of more later, <laughs> is, um, is to uh, Brenna. Um, so I'm really interested in this idea of printable things from the H5P, and I cannot figure out what a page one printable is. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, is it different than like a PDF where you just have the worksheet that could be included? I mean, maybe not a PDF, like you would just put it in the, the press book and then it would print out. I don't know. Yeah. So sorry, I blew through that and I was speaking quickly. Okay. Um, so the first thing that's important is that it's imaginary. <laughs> this is an idea that I've been talking about with Pressbooks folks, but the idea is that so many of the H5P activities, like if you just took a screenshot of them, if you just had them as an image on the first page of the H5P exercise, they would be usable, right? So that's why I call them page one printables. It's like what you're looking at on page one is printable. Um, and the idea is for particularly with the Pressbooks integration, that an H5P exercise um, that is in a Pressbook would um, by default appear as uh, an image of the first page so that a student working from the print version of the text could just work it out in pen. So lots of activities would work fine that way, uh, multiple choice, fill in the blanks, you'd miss some of the functionality for sure, but you could at least get that formative exercise. Um, so that is is currently on, on the desk of the folks at Pressbooks. And I know Steel Wagstaff at, at Pressbooks has been a big champion of that going forward. So it is it is functionality that we're, we're hoping for, and it would certainly make a difference to a lot of the populations of students that we serve. Yeah, that, that sounds excellent. Yeah, I, I have not used H5P in any of the textbooks that I've been working on. Um, but we have been thinking about, you know, how do you take what's um, online and turn it into something printable? And that's yeah. something I'm really, really interested in so that we can do more. Because right time. now what it does is when you when you do the printed version, um, it's basically a link appears there. And it's yeah. like, there's an H5P activity, go click on this link, which, you know, if is you can. one thing if you're downloading the resource <laughs> for convenience. It's another thing if you're incarcerated right like very different context for learning so definitely something that i i'm keeping top of mind and i know that the folks at press books are too thank you and i see kate is uh saying something in the oh connie go ahead your hand is up yeah oh thank you so much uh thank you to all the presenters uh, a good diversity of interesting presentations and research uh, my question is for Melissa, and um, I was curious in how the students identified in open pedagogy this idea of creativity and the importance of it, and yet uh, it seemed you didn't report anything from faculty. So can you speak a little bit more about that area of creativity and your findings? 
I shall unmute myself first <laughs> before responding. Um, yes, thank you for asking. So I didn't have time to share all the results today, but um, there were a lot of results that came out of um, came out of the my study and um, creativity. So the feedback from faculty has was overwhelmingly positive that they received from students that they liked they liked engaging in it and um i can't remember off the top of my head what some of the comments were that were um received but they were overwhelmingly positive um because one of the questions i asked of faculty or what feedback have you received from students um and it was all positive so i'm not able to answer just i can get back to you through email uh, about the creativity part um, but the feedback the faculty received from students was very good mm, thanks so much I, and that's what i think is uh, actually i think it actually drives quite a bit of the open pedagogy is actually the creativity and the unpredictable nature of creativity and where it takes us. And that creates novel learning situations and novelty, of course, is what the human mind loves so much. So um, I'm glad to see that it percolated up in your findings. And um, that's an area I've been thinking about uh, doing some research on. So that sort of helps me, you know, confirm that that's a good direction, a good topic to go into. and. Uh, do you anticipate publishing your results or what are you going to be doing? Yes, absolutely. I, I want to. Uh, it's on my list of things to do. Uh, so I do hope to be able to, to publish the results um, at some point in the near future. No, that would be great. Well, I'm an associate editor with our model, so um, you know, I can't say for sure it'll get published, but it would certainly get into the queue. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> It's always lovely to have some interesting, uh, solid research in the area of openness. So thank you for your work. Thank you so much. Excellent. And by the way, it, there are some connecting threads that I perceive. I'm sure others are perceiving them. Uh, there's been a couple of mentions uh, from one presentation to another, uh, some transitions. But if you have questions about anything else, uh, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. Yeah. And uh, Kate was talking about uh, Hispanic serving institution. Uh, so would you like to to uh, ask it out loud or to, to tell us about that, uh, you know, developing OER simultaneously in different languages? I know there, there were some answers uh, in the chat, but Kate, if you want to express that a little bit orally. Hi, I don't know if you can actually hear me. I can, we can. Um, we just recently became an Hispanic serving institution. We also have a um, increasing long body. Uh, we have Somali immigrants uh, who are in the area. We also run the ESL program, um, but there is an encouragement to move students from the ESL program into uh, broader based education once they get to level four. And this can be very frustrating if you're teaching in a broader based education and you're struggling to communicate basic concepts in a language which you do not speak. My Spanish is minuscule but improving. I don't speak Mong, I do not speak um, Somali uh, or any of the languages of that area, and I don't speak Pashtun. Um, so my ability to communicate basic concepts is hampering these students' chances of being successful. And one of the things that we are hoping to do with OERs is um, to make content available in a format that students whose primary language is not English can have better understanding of the basic concepts so that they will 
be able to achieve success and go on. And my college sort of picked me and said, go to this conference. Because <laughs> there you go. You've used OERs and you're trying to write OERs. So you can go and find out about OERs and come back and tell us. And that's why I'm here. Uh, we Excellent. are j just beginning to do this. And which college is that? This is Milwaukee Area Technical College. Nice, nice. We are and part of a state system that handles about 140,000 students on 40 different campuses across the state. Nice. And are there some people on the panel who have experience with uh, working on OERs with, in languages they don't know themselves or they're not that fluent in? That can be certainly a challenge, or maybe if you can compare with experiences, let's say with accessibility. Or just with languages that you do have fluency in, uh, but not necessarily other people. I know that for uh, U of A, uh, the French campus, Sarah is unfortunately not with us, but uh, uh, has this been a challenge within the team? Um, so it, I think that the challenge for us is that we actually, we, we have a lot of librarians who don't work at the French campus who do speak, uh, French, um, Edmonds Lake Alberta does have quite a large French community. So we do have a lot of, uh, French speakers at the library, which is good. I think the, the more issue for us is like availability of materials in French than, um, capacity within the library. Now, that's been an issue as well um, here is that there are many Hispanic speaking faculty and staff members, um, but finding resources in Spanish um, can be frustrating and uh, very rarely, even if I find the resource, do I have it in translation so that I can know what it is. If it's in French, if it's in German, if it's in Latin, I'm fine. Spanish, uh, not so much. Hmong, Arabic, <laughs> forget it. Um, so, you know, how do um, a global conference, um, you know, I was hoping perhaps to find uh, I saw that some of the panels looked as if they were in Arabic, uh, and I was hoping to contact with someone there and think maybe, um, you know, do you have, uh, do you use any of the same resources? Um, you know, is there uh, a way to provide Arabic resources for Arabic speaking students? Um, Absolutely. Looking to see what's out there. Yeah, and, and there were some uh, pr presentations already about uh, uh, Arabic and French speaking contexts, uh, at least this morning in the uh, Dynamic Coalition. And the issue of translating uh, resources has been brought up that uh, part of the issue is that sometimes they don't accept the resources uh, coming from another language because they don't ha typically have the, the same standards. But uh, are there some uh, ideas about uh, ways to make it work across languages? Or any kind of trick that you found to, uh, to get people to collaborate across languages, uh, which does happen quite a bit in open education, right? If anyone has insight. And certainly we can connect later. Uh, there are presentations in Arabic, uh, Spanish, French, uh, Russian, and I think Chinese as well, Mandarin Chinese. It's supposed to be the six uh, UNESCO languages. Um, and many of those also speak English. So it's probably possible to uh, connect with them and you know, ask them how they, uh, they perceive this challenge uh, to, to find or create uh, those resources. Yeah. Okay. No, my teaching schedule is also very heavy this week. Yeah. So it's yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been attending sessions when I am not teaching. Makes sense. Makes sense. We'll we'll try to connect, 
And uh, maybe maybe in the page, uh, you know, I kept mentioning it, but the, the page on Connect uh, from this uh, webinar, uh, that might be, uh, oh, sorry about that for uh, for Russian. Uh, but still, you know, we, we have uh, presentations in, in at least five languages. And uh, so it's probably possible to ask around and people can do asynchronously uh, tell you, uh, you know, what what they perceive uh, from their perspective. Other interventions, feel free to raise your hand if you have uh, something to discuss. Yeah, Lilia is really active. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work done between separate, you know, uh, I think it's three or four uh, Arabic speaking uh, countries where they, they, do, uh, they do a whole uh, initiative uh, among them. So again, other questions? I'm sure you have some. <laughs> and other comments, maybe? I've seen several comments about uh, collaboration and partnerships. Uh, any lesson that you've learned about uh, making those connections work, those partnerships work, especially across borders, as it happened between Montgomery College and Maricopa and so on? Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in and then my, my colleagues on the leadership team can certainly add their thoughts. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with these partnerships is time zone differences uh, and, and how you manage those time zone differences to accommodate for the different meetings that we have to have. Uh, so it, it takes a, a little bit of, of scheduling, a little bit of flexibility uh, to make it work. I don't know if Shinta or you agree if you want to jump in. Debbie? Yeah, I, yeah, sure. I'll also say that, you know, one of the challenges we faced in these, um, you know, inter-institution, interdisciplinary projects was, you know, the different, the different, um, the laws that govern what we're able to do with students. And so in BC, you know, privacy is taken you know, very seriously. And so there are these groups who want to perhaps use, uh, you know, freely available software on the web to create infographics or, or something like that. But the partner in BC can't necessarily ask their students to do that. Um, so we came across some of these issues and working around them has been challenging, but really helpful also to think about what needs to be done um, in terms of you know, creating software and other sort of platforms that you know, take into consideration students' privacy. And I'll also add to Uruja's note on the restrictions on students. We also have uh, institution specific uh, limitations or challenges around faculty too, like faculty contracts, faculty course load, um, faculty uh, uh, logistics in general. So those are things that we have over the years um, figured out how to iron out some and others are still quite of the challenge. And in fact, if there are some people in the in the room, in the virtual room, who have more knowledge about uh, legal issues across uh, institutions and borders, I know uh, I, I don't know if uh, Melanie Brunet is still there, but she's also a copyright uh, uh, librarian. Uh, so there are some differences in the way uh, copyright regimes are applied. There's been some some talk about the differences between fair use in the U.S. and fair dealing in Canada. So. If there's anything about uh, differences in, in legal issues or institutional issues that you've also uh, been through. If anyone has anything to share about uh, differences or other challenges that you've had in partnerships. I can share one other challenge um, that I shared in the chat about uh, the difference between original language uh, original content um, from languages and translated content and uh, here in Ontario in Canada we have um, deep connections with the um, the Franco Ontarian community and and their dialect specific type of, of French is is different even from the French that they speak in Quebec and and has its own its own important context and so one of the things I learned in working with that community is the importance as well of of seeking um, seeking out content and the support of the development of content that is in its original language, because a translation often um, loses a lot of that local context that is so important, as we know, for 
for learning and for our learners to feel that sense of belonging and connection. So um, just another challenge to add to the pile of challenges that related to um, working in different languages with OER. Um, it's a great question though, Kate, and I'm really glad that you asked it. And I think you will find that this, this community has a, has a lot of experience uh, um, dealing with those similar challenges. So I hope you're able to make it to other sessions where some other people have something to share on that, on that topic. Makes sense. And, and sometimes using just the, 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 the most international language possible, because you were talking about, uh, Lena, uh, specifically about Franco-Ontarians, if we were to use international French or even Quebec French, very often the sense of belonging we keep talking about, the localization aspect, like we talk about it in, in computer science as being just, you know, some parameters for for time zone and, and uh, maybe uh, the way you express, uh, you know, currency, but it's actually about culture, basically. So are, and in fact, are there comments about how those initiatives connect to how we adapt either practices or uh, resources across different communities? Like we keep talking about open education as being so global, but uh, very often it's about adapting those things to local context. And we've had some examples today, but I'm sure there are more uh, comments about this. about the challenges and opportunities of adapting, uh, you know, practices and or resources from one context to the other. Then again, maybe not. Feel free to raise your hand if you have something to say, uh, a comment or something else. We still have quite a bit of time actually, <laughs> because we've been very quick <laughs> for some reason. I'll add um, in relation to our fellowship, one of the things that we continuously find astonishing uh, across the partners, partners and across the years is that we've had faculty who are really well versed in the United Nations work and they know a lot about the SDGs. And then we have a pocket of faculty who are really well versed in open pedagogy and open education and OERs. But very few actually have have thought about the two together, have worked in the areas in which those two concepts are coupled. And so it, it when they come to the, the to apply for the fellowship, they're always so uh, thrilled, astonished, um, you know, just wondering, well, what is this going to look like? And so what, even though, as you mentioned, open education is this global concept and we've been working at it for so long, it still really amazes us when we find that there are still so many faculty out there who um, really need, uh, you know, that those professional development opportunities to learn more about it. And do you perceive that it's also that people can be well versed in the material like subject matter experts, and don't think about teaching that much possibly, like it happens in other fields. So do you think it, it, it bears some relationship to that? I Should certainly I, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I certainly think there is some relationship to that. And anyone uh, from my the leadership team who might have some examples from their own institutions could speak to that as well. So I, I'm not sure I have immediate examples, but I would also add that um, there's some unfamiliarity or un, uncomfortableness or vulnerability, if you will, around the idea of working in an interdisciplinary um, uh, development, right? The, the faculty that we work with tend to be quite comfortable in their own content area with their own classes, but because we ask them to work in a way that is cross institutional and cross disciplinary, in addition to asking them to do this dive into open pedagogy and, and the sustainable development goals, it, it can be very challenging for folks. Um, and but I, I would say that we tend to address those on a case by case basis. <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of uh, the, even the shame that some people have. They don't want to share resources because they don't think it's good enough. I've heard that in some very, very formal context, but you're thinking that they're already sharing those resources with students 
or the practices themselves. Obviously, they share those with students, but sometimes they don't want to share with colleagues. There, there's some uh, reluctance there. Yeah. Mike, I saw your camera come on. Uh, did you want to to speak about this? Yeah. Yeah, I, and it's it just a follow up to to something that that was Shinta, I think, had mentioned, and and it's this growth that that we see in those who participate. So they they come into this this partnership, this fellowship, and really aren't quite sure. As, as Shinta said, they may have the the open background, they may have the SDG background, but marrying them together, and so they go through this summer program. And and you can just see that they're they they're like our students. They they are lost. And then all of a sudden the lights come on and it, it clicks. And it it really is a, a wonderful thing to watch faculty get the same, have the same level of enthusiasm as our students have when they learn this concept of, of taking the, the open pedagogy practices with the SDGs and the renewable assignments and, and bringing them all together. It's, it's fun to watch. And it sounds like we need the same patience and care that we have with our students when we apply that to faculty development, right? Like it's not because they're professionals and such that they don't deserve the same kind of, of kindness. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Other interventions about uh, about this this pairing of expertise between you know subject matter maybe and understanding open education largely or specifically so, maybe from other teams yeah go ahead th and this is Kelly McKenna um, yeah. and I'll share so we actually presented earlier this morning on an OER program um, and we while we developed it for the United States. Um, it is a global program that and a global organization. So when we started our work with UNESCO and doing it in Uganda, our on the ground partners in Uganda actually had to take, we're the content experts and they had to take it and make it more local um, so that it would um, apply for the standards within the country, as well as also then from a rural uh, capacity, both even from, from what they were teaching in the city versus what they were teaching rurally, um, to make it work on a more local basis. Um, and then I'll also chime in a little bit with regards to translation. It's something we would love to do. Um, we've talked about numerous ways. We actually, our uh, partner um, in education is tryengineering.org, and they are in the process of taking some of their um, open resources and translating them in different languages. I believe they're using Google. We're not as, we'd like to have somebody else then actually look at it again for those nuances um, and everything else relative to translations. Um, so it is a challenge and it can be costly. And how do you meet that cost? How do you meet that challenge? It's one of the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. And maybe opening up to other issues you've thought about, uh, you know, to the whole room uh, during those presentations. I know it's been a lot of, uh, well, and for us uh, in the on the East Coast, it's already the end of the day. So maybe you're tired or yeah. Okay, so Lena has to go. Uh, but uh, if you have questions, comments, or anything like that, uh, we're still here. And sometimes those interventions near the end of a webinar like this can be like the thing nobody else thought about, <laughs> which could still be useful, interesting. I think one of the, the things I, I liked about the H5P presentation by um, Rena was this focus on time. And, and you know, one of the things that our faculty struggle with is finding time to engage in, in this work and with all they have going on elsewhere in the institution. And it, it certainly isn't that they're, they're against the innovation or the engagement. It's just trying to find the time in the day to do it. Yeah, and maybe Brenna, you, you can talk about that. Like, are, are there ways where 
it actually saves time <laughs> that you don't have to reinvent a wheel or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think the great thing about H5P is just how infinitely shareable it is, like like so many aspects of open, about how easy it is to um, so to get in and adapt to your own context. I'm really lucky in the role I have, um, although most of my play happened before I had to move 500 faculty online in, in a week. So, you know, there are swings and roundabouts, but I do get a lot of time to play. Um, and I get a lot of time to sort of imagine my way into different disciplines and, and how these tools work. And I think those rules are really important on our campuses because um, when you're teaching four and four or five and five, as I, I did for most of my career, um, it is really hard to, to find that space. Um, but I think the more capacity we can build within our institutions for this kind of sharing and conversation, um, you know, that thesis development exercise that I, I made um, gets used all across our institution in all kinds of different disciplines now that it's built, right? Because now that it's built, you just need to go in and tweak it with your prompts and your applications. Um, but that building piece needs, there's no way around it. The building needs time and it needs the support. I'm really lucky to be in a unit where my director really recognizes the value of play, frankly, in, in discovery and innovation. And that, that piece is critical. It's funny, it's like the time we spend playing, sometimes people think about it as wasted time, but typically the more you play, and for musicians, that's certainly something that the more you rehearse, the less time you will need later on. Like if you you explore widely, it can really help. And certainly for H5P, like uh, some people might think that we're just advocating for something at random, but it's been observed by a number of people that a lot of faculty members will take to it without asking anyone for support. They will just try it and do something with it and explore. Actually, not to, to self-promote, but uh, profwet.ca, we just released uh, a real life story from a teacher who's been uh, building simulations for her students. And she had contacted us uh, about sharing those. And there are some opportunities, not, not many of them in French, but uh, there are some opportunities to, to share. And then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's a little bit like in open source and free software, the idea of forking, you, you fork a project from one place to another, it becomes your own project, but you don't have to reinvent everything that's behind it. Like even the libraries that they call in, in uh, software development, that you reuse something that has been built by somebody else. So are there other examples of time-saving uh, things we can do uh, by using open education practices and resources? I'm sure some people have some examples. And if not, I'll I'll uh, get Emily to to ask her question. Emily. Uh, hi. <laughs> Thanks. So it's a pretty big question to ask at the end of the day, as I kind of mentioned. But I'm really interested right now in looking at institutional policies um, because we're looking at perhaps promoting an institutional policy at our college. I, I'm from Camosun College here in British Columbia. And just the idea that getting students to kind of push up from the bottom, but we need institutional leadership to really um, help push from the top as well to make sure people are supported adequately. So not just faculty, but also anybody, librarians, anybody in the uh, teaching and learning centers, people like that. And, and uh, so I'm interested in learning more about how people have worked with leadership at institutions to develop those policies and to create sustainable support models for this kind of work. So Emily, I saw in your in your question you specifically mentioned ten, mentioned tenure and promotion criteria. I also think about hiring criteria around these pieces. Um, those are faculty driven, right? So like. At TRU, we've recently, I think almost every faculty now has included language around open and prioritizing open in, in tenure and promotion, um, or at least giving space, right? Not everybody has to do it, but giving it an equal space and an equal weight to other venues of publication. Um, and I think increasingly, we're hiring a provost right now. And uh, so making sure there's people at those 
town halls around the questions that are going to be asked of the new provost. You know, how what is what is your background in open education? What kinds of initiatives have you supported or spearheaded? How do you see the work of open at this institution progressing under your leadership? Like getting those questions on the table, that is all within the the purview of faculty, um, not that we always get listened to, but I think making sure that it's a central part of the conversation is something that we can do and we can encourage our colleagues to, to, to help us in that work. Um, so that's that's the piece I'm at right now, agitating, always, always already agitating. I like that you're an agitator, Brenna, for sure. And I, I work at an institution where tenure and promotion, we don't have those entities at Camosun College. We work a little bit differently. So that becomes a different question about how do we as faculty advocate in that kind of environment as well. So a little bit different, but thank you for your point about getting the faculty to also agitate on the behalf of uh, using open Excellent. And, and uh, Melissa's point on invis invisible labor, I, I don't know if you're willing to share some observations from, uh, from your research about this, but uh, do you perceive that, I, I know that at Quentin, probably <laughs> invisible labor is understood to be part of it, right? But uh... Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, my institution I'm very lucky at my institution and in that open education is, no pun intended, openly embraced. Um, and But there is a lot of invisible labor. Um, a couple of years ago, the Rebus community uh, did a number of office hour uh, type sessions. I participated in one of them and they have others on the same topic of how do, how do we do this? Our, you know, as an if you're an adjunct faculty, you're not getting paid to do the work, but you want to do the work because you want to show that you're contributing to the department and there's value and maybe you feel passionate about it, but that it's invisible because it's it's labor for free. Um, I, I don't really have any any solutions, any answers to suggest for that, but it is a it is a big problem of making sure that the work is recognized. What does it look to be um, to have the work recognized? It was interesting to me coming from an institution like where I'm working to still, in spite of all the supports and wonderfulness that we have, that faculty were still saying there's a lack of recognition, there's a lack of, you know, um, compensation, there's a lack of funding for all of this. And, Kwantlen is doing so many amazing things, um, but invisible labor is an issue, and it's not it's not an easy one to solve. It might even be a problem for people not recognize, recognizing the value of their own work, right? But since we have some people who are more on the institutional side, I don't know if you have anything to share about how it's taken into account. The, the the kind of work well assessing that kind of work and beyond just the hours being spent specifically on the task at montgomery montgomery we try to provide faculty if it's release time if they're doing it at the course level uh, if they're redesigning a course to move to a, an open textbook they um, can apply to to get course release for that Are there examples where institutions are really supporting in ways that are beyond what we discussed? And maybe Christina, can can you, you you're adding useful comments, but uh, maybe you can share uh, directly. Sure. Yeah. I sometimes just get busy in the chat and forget I could actually speak up. So, just talking about tenure and promotion, and I think you know it's really it may be different at different institutions because Brennan was talking about departments maybe having their own. Um, criteria, and at least at our institution in Canada and in uh, University of British Columbia, um, we have a, a collective agreement between the institution and the faculty union, um, and that lays out the sort of main criteria, uh, and that's sort of the same across the institution. So um, the way we've managed to get open into tenure promotion is uh, through uh, what I also put in the chat, our Senior Appointments Committee Guide to Tenure and Promotion, which is this long, you know, 
document that says, here are all the things that you have to, to follow for tenure and promotion. And it fits within the collective agreement, but it's in that guide that we were able to, well, I shouldn't say we, it was really students. I sort of just was watching from the sidelines. And because I think you might be willing to answer this, do you think those criteria are fair? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's actually really interesting because I also write review letters for tenure promotion for faculty at our institution. And I'm like, every time I look at those criteria, I'm like, those are really kind of odd. Why is it those? <laughs> um, so yeah, but they they're go through the collective bargaining process where, you know, you've got team on the university and the team on the side of the faculty association and they bargain and then something comes out. So um, that isn't to say there's no way to get involved in that. There certainly is, um, but it's a little bit removed. Yeah. Yeah, there's been quite a bit of talk today, including in other sessions about uh, recognition. And it sounds like it's one of the incentives that might not be discussed openly by most people, but part of it is about recognition more than just money. Right, we talk a lot about funding, but uh, maybe some people here have uh, something to share about recognition that open education in general can help in terms of recognition more than just in terms of getting an income uh, from uh, doing those uh, that that kind of work. I think um, this is Shinsar Hernandez, and I think one of the ways that we could recognize is to find a, an opportunity to put this work in the institution's strategic plans. Um, I think where when it's in places like that, a master plan, document, some sort of um, formal plan, it becomes recognized, it becomes supported by leadership up and down the ladder. Um, and I, I recognize that that's difficult and that it doesn't, it's not an overnight thing. Um, but when you have that kind of uh, formality, when you have kind of that kind of support, it becomes obviously a bit easier to, to gain the recognition that faculty, staff, and others deserve when they do this kind of work. Any kind of uh, testimonial from a faculty member who uh, has sought and received recognition <laughs> or aligned? <laughs> Again, like so that's a great point about the strategic plan is that if you perceive the alignment, that might help even if the recognition is less formal in some cases. But uh, I'm sure some faculty members and other learning pros here have uh, received that recognition. There's some awards and such, right? I know that I've nominated uh, faculty members like colleagues for open education awards offered through BC campus and I think someone from BC campus is here today, um, which is fantastic to be able to lift up colleagues who are doing that work and help them get that recognition from BC campus to get that award, um, I think is it's been fun it's been fun to do for others. Yeah, and there's something about awards in open education that have to do with sharing the rewards, right? I, I remember uh, Rajiv uh, talking on a podcast about receiving an award and basically sharing it with everyone, much much more so than at the MAEs sharing the glory. It's really about, no, no, seriously, this is about the work we can do together, right? So it's not giving an award to one faculty member instead of everybody else. Uh, it's not uh, like I, I was teaching at Concordia for a while and they did a world cafe for the strategic plan. The first question, unfortunately, was uh, imagine in five years someone from Concordia wins a Nobel Prize. How did we get there? And the first section was really about questioning the question, saying, no, it's not about one person receiving an award. It's about sharing that wealth, that, that reward, right? So there's a lot. Uh, yeah. Ariana, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about it? That's a great point for uh, the, the award for excellence in open education. Uh, talk about the award? Yeah. How um, does it work? What's your insight on it? Yeah, um, I'm actually the person who coordinates, uh, like handles, receives the nominations and then gets the ball rolling. So yeah, this is kind of my wheelhouse. Um, basically, we have this nomination form, which I've just uh, place a link to in the chat. This is only for BC faculty and instructors, by the way. Um, I know this is a global conference, sorry, but I couldn't resist the urge to plug. Uh, 
<laughs> um, and basically we look through the nominations and just see, uh, it's a great way for us to learn who is making great strides in open education in BC. And we look at the nomination form, see if that's a project or a course or a resource worth promoting. Uh, and then we basically, we write a blog post about the person and then we send them a certificate and we get in contact with like the, uh, often it's the vice president academic at their institution. And so that they, we know that, that they um, can be recognized by university administration and leadership as well. So yeah, we, we help them place themselves in front of their leadership and their department or the university overall to be like, look, they've done something great and you should know about it. Uh, so that's, that's how we make sure their work is acknowledged. Uh, yeah, that's basically how it is. We do it every month. Um, so it's a good way to promote our champions of open education in BC. Yeah, and the, the, the frequency actually helps a lot when it's once a year with a bunch of awards all at the same time, I think it has less of an impact. And those blog posts, like to be honest, like the, the BC campus site, I actually added it to a, a AI based uh, creation system uh just about different approaches to online education and uh, some of the the items i get thanks to that come from basically recognition of good work right mm -hmm. what goes around go, uh, what comes around goes around or is it vice versa yeah other examples are i'm sure at this time i'm sure there aren't that many people from uh, the eastern hemisphere but uh, maybe some people in other parts of the world who, who are aware of uh, awards and recognition and things like that that systems that can help uh, bring about op open education across their environment or maybe not and we're getting close to the end, so it's basically to wrap up. Or if you have any last thoughts, any parting thoughts uh, to get us to collaborate, to partner up, to uh, make links between our different initiatives. There are some we didn't hear from that much. Uh, I, I don't tend to, uh, to uh, point people out, but uh, you know, If some of the speakers who didn't talk as much, like I'm kind of looking at Michelle actually, but I don't want to call on people that much. Any last thoughts from anyone? I'll share one last thought. Um, this is Shinta Hernandez again from yep. Montgomery College. We were talking about this earlier uh, with respect to when our faculty, particularly in our fellowship here, when our faculty experience our professional development opportunities and they learn more about the different components of our fellowship and we, we, we exercise grace and kindness and things like that. I also want to emphasize that the leadership team is also growing and learning too. And I am so appreciative of the fact that our, our leadership team across the seven institutional partners are wanting to do that, willing to do that. And so every year, we find ways to be, uh, to make our fellowship even better. And so I am so, I, I really appreciate the different innovative ways that the leadership team have come together to um, make the partnership and the, and the fellowship better. And Mike Mills just put in a chat, if you're interested in more details about partnering with us on the fellowship, we'd love to discuss these opportunities with you. Sounds great, sounds great. And now there, there's two minutes left. Uh, the, the one thing I'll say is that clearly this is not the end of either the conference or all of those issues we've been discussing. So I will still insist to say, go back to that page for this webinar. Uh, you'll find those like-minded people that you now uh, know a little bit more and either ask questions, share resources, uh, links, questions, no, comments, all of these things. And don't be strangers. Some of us are on Twitter. So I did uh, post, uh, so OE Global 21 is the hashtag for the conference. And uh, there are some uh, tweets about uh, this specific webinar, but obviously 
if you can, if you, your teaching schedule or work schedule isn't as uh, as busy as Kate's, uh, you know, if you can uh, participate in other webinars, that will be awesome. And as I said at the beginning, the uh, recording from the session will be available uh, not too uh, far long from ah, <laughs> at some point uh, pretty soon. Uh, it will be the same page that I posted from uh, from uh, OE Global Connect which is uh, partly animated uh, uh, masterfully by Alan Levine, who's in the chat uh, sharing uh, the hashtag and all of that. So again, don't be strangers and keep up the good work with open education. And now we can stop the recording. <laughs>